I believe most days because I discern that the world does not depend on me, that there is a greater force, greater love at work than I could ever conceive or imagine. And then I see signs of that grace and that mercy all around me. And maybe more than anything else, the moments that warm my heart are the moments when I discern that something or someone is being healed. On In Good Faith, we believe that all faith traditions have something to teach us about how God is working in the world and in our lives. So join us as we listen and learn. Today on In Good Faith, we get to combine jazz with the gospel. And I don't know how often that happens in your life, but after talking with our guest today, I've decided not enough. <laughs> <laughs> and this will be a, a help towards putting those things together. Man, he's an author. He's a poet. More about our guest in just a moment. I'm with Heather Bigley, our senior producer. Hello. And also with our producer, Aliyah Ebert. Hey, everyone. So our guest... William G. Carter, Bill Carter, is both a pianist and a Presbyterian minister, and he just thought those were kind of two separate parts of his life, but God surprises us all with what his plans are. He's the pastor and head of staff at First Presbyterian Church of Clark Summit in Pennsylvania and the leader of the Presby Bop Quartet, and he's just written a book called Thriving on a Riff, Jazz and the Spiritual Life from Broadleaf Books. And so in that book and in the interview, he talks a lot about jazz community and church community and maybe some things that we can learn from each other. Yeah, I was really struck by a quote in the book that I bring up to him about how musicians are notably non-judgmental about each other's lives. And I started by just saying, how did you start to play jazz piano in church? Sure, sure. Well, the way that Presbyterians do it, at least in the North, is you lead a service on a Sunday, you preach a sermon, and then everybody there gets to vote. Uh, and the vote went well, but then somebody who knew my background stood up in the back pew, on the pew, and said, we heard you preach, and that was fine, but why don't you play something for us? And I said, well, that's not why I'm here. I came to this church because it was a great music program. And they said, well, that's what you think. So they cajoled me into stomping out a rock and roll version of Amazing Grace. And then somebody said, what else are you going to do? I said, well, I'm going to go say goodbye to my other congregation right now. I'll see you in a couple of weeks. So I thought I was putting it on hold just as I did when I went to seminary. But I think the Holy Spirit has other plans and just music kept bubbling up and the invitations kept coming in curious and intriguing ways. And ever since that fateful date, which was in September 1990, I've been working at weaving together music and ministry as a coherent whole. Well, the new book is called Thriving on a Riff, William G. Carter, Jazz and the Spiritual Life. But as a pastor, you know that from the time of the Psalms, at least, music has been mixed together with ritual and with faith. Well, that, that's right. The unfortunate thing, or maybe fortunate in another sense, is that when the Psalms were written down and eventually published, at least in our form of being published, all those texts lost their tunes. Every once in a while, one will have a superscription that says a Psalm of David or a tune to the lilies or something like that. But there was no way in antiquity that we know of where music could be documented. Uh, music was probably made in a mentor situation. And so it was copied and it was uh, represented. And the, the blessing in that, I believe, is that every community of faith that prays the Psalms has the opportunity to represent it with fresh music. Mm. Certainly my tradition which goes through Geneva and Scotland. Uh, Presbyterians have loved the Psalms as others have. I want to ask about how music can change people. That's something we innately feel. What do you think it is about music that works with worship? Well, I think it seeps into our pores in a different way. The people who study how we learn uh, discover that with multiple intelligences, some see and read and some hear and some do. But I think there's an extra multiple intelligence for music. That music can transmit 
compassion and information and hope and despair. And the worship service is like following a narrative. So music works in a narrative way as well, like a good symphony with different movements. It, it takes us, carries us on a journey. And I think that's one of the ways it begins to change us, if only to open us to the capacity of beauty or to drive us to the further depths of our humanity or surprise us and awaken us to maybe a holy or spiritual presence that we weren't aware of beforehand. talked about to carry them on a journey have you have you had to carry your congregations on a bit of a journey to expand their minds to jazz in the worship service oh sure oh sure about a year and a half after i landed here um, our organist was despairing she couldn't find a substitute for a, a labor day weekend and looked all over the place and no one was available. And in desperation, she asked at a committee meeting, could you play the hymns? And I said, sure. And she said, are you gonna jazz them up? And I said, well, is that all right? Why not? And when we opened the door that day, the sanctuary was full for a holiday weekend when most people would be at the lake. And I had put together a slightly jazzed up service and at the end of it, uh, they asked a question that frightened me. Will you do this again next week? And as we began to develop an annual jazz service on that weekend, uh, we had a couple people say, well, I'll see you the week after that. I'm going to take that week off. They couldn't perceive of jazz as being a container of the whole. They were so consumed maybe with you know popular misrepresentations. This is music created by drug addicts or belongs in smoky bistros or their dens of iniquity, but they hadn't heard it as a form of art. So that's been the journey, and I see it as a spiritual journey. There's a benevolent, graceful force that has been inviting us forward to step into it. I hope I get this quote right from the book, that you say something to the effect of, musicians are famously non-judgmental about each other's human foibles and failings. Oh, yeah. And that actually seemed like church to me. Well, a church at its best. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we all hunger for a community where people take us as we are. And I have found that on the bandstand in some ways that I haven't always found in the church. And I say that as a, as a church leader. You know, when I go on tour with the guys for a week out of the year or so, we get in the car and within 30 seconds, we're laughing, we're telling jokes, we're talking about our kids. We're sharing our medical struggles, and it's real. It's authentic. And I experience grace that way, in that welcome. And so I constantly am wondering and encouraging my church leaders here, what would it be like for others to experience that sort of welcome and that mm. openness as well? Do you write all of the poems? They're uncredited, and they appear throughout. So I'm assuming they're yours. They are mine, and they were all done pretty spontaneously with a minimal amount of editing. We get into this chapter called Improvisation Lessons in Dissonance. And if you wouldn't mind reading this, I think this is a, a sort of a good entree into understanding new music and worship. Lesson in Dissonance. She pushes down two adjacent piano keys, flinches, declaring, that's ugly, maybe. Any two notes side by side could bite one another in bitter harmony. Play them again. Sustain the cluster. Let tension ring. Still ugly, perhaps. Resolution will not come easily, like hearts out of phase. Hit them again, together. Pedal to the floor. Tension sustains. Perceiving the unheard reference tone, now vibrations resonate. Strings hum with one another. Beauty is hidden in the dissonance. Listen until you hear it. Listen again. That beauty is hidden in the dissonance, that implies a necessary bit of searching or contemplation about it. You have a beautiful example 
This is with John Coltrane's A Love Supreme. I wonder if you would mind talking about the story of you finding that album and actually the angularity or maybe even the ugliness of it in a way being a spiritual bomb. Do you mind telling that story? My folks had sent me next door to help out a neighbor who was digging a drainage ditch of all things. Uh, I was 17 or so. It was a Saturday morning. I really didn't want to go, but, you know, off I went. And shuffle in hand, I was talking to a, a man I had not met, another friend of the neighbor. And he found out I was a jazz musician or wanted to be. And he said, have you heard John Coltrane's A Love Supreme? And I said, well, I've, I've heard the name Coltrane. I really haven't found that. So I tucked away that music and picked it up when I was maybe a few months later, after I'd mowed a few more lawns, made a little more money and put it on. And instantly, members of the household said, would you please turn that down? It was harsh. It was strange. It was bizarre. But I listened to the whole thing and kind of tucked away and thought, well, I spent good money on this. I'm not going to throw out the album or give it away. And shortly after that, our family went through a medical crisis. My dad was diagnosed with a form of leukemia, and everything just went dark and shut down. And it turned out he was cured rather miraculously. But somewhere in that curing, I played the album again, this time with headphones, and the music found me. It's kind of like the theologian Belden Lane says about holy places. Uh, you don't find them, they find you. And I think that's sometimes spiritually how it works with music. Something kind of reaches you. And I heard the music then as a prayer. Coltrane had created that suite as a form of prayer. And it was not the kind of traditional, popularized, Americanized success story of I found God or Jesus and suddenly everything turned out well. It was more, I started the path, it healed me, and then there was more challenge, and in the end, there's peace. Mm -hmm. Which is how Coltrane perceived it, which is, I think, a much more valid path. It, again, like Amazing Grace, uh, many toils, snares, I have already come. There, there are bumps on the road, and yet there's something that carries us through and the promise of that Sabbath, that rest, that peace, that restoration. You talk about improvisation that's necessary. And in fact, one of the, the beautiful th and intriguing things about jazz, also one of the reasons why no performance is necessarily exactly the same as another. How do you tie that to spiritual lives and the need for improvisation? Improvisation at its earliest form in jazz music was, was simply messing around with the melody, adding a personal stamp to it, and speaking it through your instrument. So there was some give and take, especially with the other musicians. And that's kind of where the magic begins. This is largely communal music, a communal art form. A lot of it can be anticipated. Some of it can be generally planned. But when it happens, you want to be there. And that's, I think, what happens with improvisation. Now, the assumption is, and this frightens a lot of trained musicians, the assumption is that when you get a piece written down on paper, it's not finished. And which is why I dare to say in the book that uh, written music is always a contradiction in terms. Music exists in the air. You can't capture it. You can only be there to participate in it either as listener or musician. So if that's true, then what if the written music or the prepared music is the launching pad, and then we dare to take the risks to step into the future based on what we've been playing? And there's no guarantee it will go well. None whatsoever. But for the skilled improviser, uh, miracles happen. This understanding. I think helps us understand music as a breathing, living art form and not something that's fixed and relies on perfection. You share a story that caught my eye of Bobby McFerrin being a piano player in Salt Lake City, and then he hears what he called the voice. 
meaning God, saying, mm-hmm. you're a singer now. And, the, and sort of an act of faith that he says, okay, I've been playing the piano. What does this mean? And then, of course, he goes on to have number one hit, Grammy Awards. Who knows that he plays the piano? That's like an afterthought now. Was there something, whether subtle or obvious, that you would call the voice or something that called you to ministry? How did that happen in your life? Oh, I heard the voice. Yeah. I assume you were already a believer, perhaps. Yes. I was raised within the church. I had accepted what I had been taught, and I knew there was more to it than I had been taught, which let this be a reminder to all of us in the religious sphere. We get some of it right, and there's even more. And as I began to explore options for my life, I thought it was going to be pre-med. And I'm in an institution of higher learning in the New York system and very scientific. And I get in there and I realize this is not for me. In fact, I was in a science library studying calculus-based physics and God spoke up and said, get out of here. <laughs> but as I began to explore where, where might the door be opening for me, the idea of ministry surfaced. And I at first shrugged it off thinking, no. I'm a churchgoer, I'm a believer, but I'd rather listen to preachers than become one. And yet the door opened and opened and opened. And then with kind of rather a narrow view of my own spiritual life, I thought, well, if I'm going to be a pastor and a preacher, I can't be a jazz musician. And then over a number of more years, it just became more and more clear that the Spirit of God had other ideas. And so the journey for me has been one, not only of improving my skills, however I can, but integrating them. So not pastor by day, pianist, jazz musician by night. Yeah, yeah and superhero on the weekends. <laughs> no, not at all. It's, 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 I mean, the spiritual life is this life. It's the life that we have. It's not waiting to rest on a cloud with golden harps. It's this life. And the next life is the great mystery that awakens to us when we get there. For here and now, how do we live joy? How do we live freedom? How do we live imagination? How do we build community? How do we address pain and racism and the ills of society? I mean, these are all deeply spiritual questions. If the spirit means anything, it means at least all of that. This book is actually my exploration of those kind of questions. You're listening to In Good Faith. I'm Stephen Cap Perry, and we'll be back with more in a moment. Hi, I'm Stephen Cap Perry, host of In Good Faith. Nothing captivates me more than people setting out on an adventure, especially if it's a place I wish I could go to or a subject I wish I knew more about, but I don't live in the right place or I don't have the equipment or the expertise. I'm telling you about a podcast from our BYU Radio family of podcasts, an award-winning podcast called Constant Wonder. With host Marcus Smith, you'll be expanding your horizons on all kinds of discovery. It could be science, it could be art, history, and more. Do you need that feeling of awe and wonder in your life more? I do, and I love it when I see how to experience that by hearing the stories of people who are doing and exploring all of those things that are so interesting to me. Check out the podcast, Constant Wonder. Welcome back to In Good Faith. We are talking with Bill Carter, a pastor who is also an author. His book is Thriving on a Riff and a working jazz musician. I read that you often ask people, how has God found you through music? How do they answer? I think about it for a while because they have not tended to think of music in that way. They've tended to think of music as a soundtrack or as entertainment or as an event, but not as something that is a moment of communion or or conflict or even challenge. So I had a friend who was going through a tough time. They had lost a job. They had lost a marriage. The kids were alienated. And we were talking one time, and I suggested a couple things. He said, what should I do? I said, well, why don't you, first of all, start working through the Psalms, and especially the ones you don't know, because there's a lot of pain lifted as prayer. 
And I said, do you have Barber's Adagio of Strings? He said, well, yes. I said, okay, turn out all the lights, put on that recording and just think into it. And the next day he called and said, I've never heard it like that before. It was like I was being bathed in light and I didn't have to create it. I simply had to show up. Wow. And I think, again, we rush through so many things. We dismiss them. We commercialize them. We turn music into something that is uh, consumed rather than something that consumes us. There you are in a jazz quartet. Is there something you learn about community in a setting like that that could apply to a church or just our communities in general? Well, a few things. First of all, everybody has something to offer and share. Second of all, we have to make room for others to do that and not dominate the conversation. And one particular piece of that with jazz is everybody is not the soloist all the time. Uh, sometimes you back up and sometimes you just need to be quiet and let them play. And that it's okay because we're held in a certain kind of communal container. It's like any relationship, a marriage or friendship, where there's a lot we can assume and presume because of the love and history that we share. You need to kind of find a good balance. And it all functions on listening to one another, which is the heart of an authentic community and something that is sorely lacking in our nation today. People aren't listening to one another. They want to win by 47%, and that's not good enough. We can participate in one another's lives by, first of all, receiving one another and an understanding one another's hurts as well as their hopes. You serve your congregation or your community as you play. Do you have moments where you've felt, God is listening to me, to this music that I'm making right now? I can remember moments in concerts or in recording sessions, when I just felt like there was applause somewhere off stage. It's fleeting, and I, I don't want to give in to it too much, lest my head be swollen. But yeah, I, I do think there are moments when we resonate with the holy purposes for the universe. And we just affirm that, yeah, we're in this together at least in this moment. You know, jazz is, is maybe the only form of music I know where mistakes that happen live are actually forgiven and must be forgiven. And as the great trumpeter told us, it's not the wrong note, it's the next note that matters. Is that Miles Davis? Miles Davis, yeah. It's the next note. Herbie Hancock hitting the wrong chord, and Miles kind of gives him a sideway glance and makes the chord sound right by playing something fresh. And they go on from there. That's a great story. Can you put your finger on why in your life have you been a believer? I believe most days because I discern that the world does not depend on me. That there is a greater force, greater love at work than I could ever conceive or imagine. And this is not made up in my imagination. And then I see signs of that grace and that mercy all around me. And maybe more than anything else, the moments that warm my heart are the moments when I discern that something or someone is being healed. The Jews have this great word, tikkun olam, which means the, the healing of the world. Mm. And that, that guides their social principles. I've seen signs of that. And that's evidence for me of the holy of God. And then I begin to read into and reflect on the narratives and the texts of, of my tradition and sometimes of other traditions. And I suddenly am given a name for this or ways to understand it. A lot of what we detect as scripture, it, it contains field reports of the same kind of benevolence at work in the world. And that's why I believe. Bill, I could spend all day talking to you. This is so interesting to me, and you're such a good storyteller and thinker. Could you read the poem on 194? And this is a true story. This is a poetic improvisation called, Are You Going to Talk About Heaven? The thin, grizzled drummer removes symbols from their stands 
A curious soul, he asks, so you are writing a book? What is it about? I pause to consider how to condense all these pages into 30 seconds of attention. Abundant life does not fit neatly in an instrument case. Stepping into my fermata, he asked fervently, are you going to talk about heaven? What can we say of heaven, God's domain? Is it the period on the paragraph, the fine on the tune, or is it a comma with an eternity? Is heaven flooded with colorblind justice? Is everybody healed? Will hungry musicians eat after the gig? Here is what I know. Heaven is a jazz solo sweeping all in its wake. Every foot taps, every head nods, every soul leans forward and nobody wants it to end. Eyes glistening, he hears the music. That was Bill G. Carter, pastor and jazz pianist, talking about music and its relationship with the gospel. One thing I really liked from his interview was his discussion of multiple different times in his life or the life of one of his friends where music really struck a chord, I guess you could say. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh. And God was able to kind of communicate with them through that way. And that's definitely something I've seen in my life that God has talked to me through that language of music over and over again. Yeah, so he started off in this audition and someone who knew of his musical prowess stands up when he's interviewing and says, aren't you going to play for us? And he's like, oh, well, what does that have to do with being a pastor? Surprise, surprise, the gifts God gives us. And I love where he talks about that he didn't set out to do this, but he just said doors kept opening for him which I thought was just a really interesting way of, of being led that we end up in surprising places in our lives. Bill Carter, he's in a jazz ensemble, and he talks about how within the ensemble, you have to support each other, you have to make space for each other, and sometimes you just need to be silent while the other person is sort of doing all the cool stuff, right? And you don't need to be jealous, you don't need to hog that. You just can appreciate it and support it happening. Many thanks to William G. Carter for speaking with us today and for the chance to use music by Presby Bop in this episode. You heard Rumpelstiltskin, Streams of Mercy, Let Them Go, Set Them Free, Deep Calls Unto Deep, Pray for Light, and Adoro Te Devote. You can find Presby Bop on Spotify Music. This episode was produced by Heather Bigley. Our production team includes Aaliyah Ebert, Leah King, Katarina Martinic, James Sturdevant, and Josh Orton. Our post-production sound designers are Lauren Sandberg and Brandon Lewis. In Good Faith is committed to the idea that we all benefit from hearing people of widely varying backgrounds share their personal experience with faith and belief. In fact, we think people with such experience deserve some of our best listening. If you love interfaith understanding, if that's important, leave a comment or review at YouTube, Spotify, Apple, wherever you listen to In Good Faith. That helps spread the word. And on social media, find us on Twitter or X at In Good Faith Pod. Instagram and Facebook are In Good Faith Podcast. YouTube is youtube.com slash at in dash good dash faith. In Good Faith is a production of BYU Radio. I'm Stephen Cap Perry. I hope you join me again soon right here in Good Faith.